even if all of these banks were to fail and governments would step in, nationalize them and promise full bailouts to everyone, which at some point I think will become impossible. But but nonetheless, if they did or if they kept doing it, at least for a while, uh, investors are smart enough to realize that that means uh, huge inflation because the only way to do that is through money printing. Here at Liberty and Finance, we're licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. We are standing by the inventory, ready to make sure you get what you need, even into the wee hours of night and on weekends, because preparedness doesn't stop. Call us, 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is Peter Kraut, the editor of Silver Stock Investor, the newsletter, and also the author of The Great Silver Bowl. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Always my pleasure, Elijah. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you back on. And I wanted to get your perspective uh, as we've seen the banking crises uh, around the world with SVB, Signature, Silvergate, um, Credit Suisse. You were actually just in Zurich a couple days after UBS took over um, Credit Suisse. So if we could get your perspective on this banking crisis right now. Absolutely. So, um, I mean, I really do think this is something that is not over, that investors need to be acutely aware of and to keep following. And as you said, uh, just by pure circumstance, I happen to be in Zurich, um, which was pretty timely um, for a mining conference, which was very <laughs> apropos. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, just to give you some numbers around that, UBS uh, decided that or I mean, it's interesting how this all happened, but it, and it happened on a weekend, which is also quite interesting. But when markets are closed, so um, Credit Suisse uh, was really ailing, has been ailing for over a decade, and um, UBS essentially on a Sunday Sunday announced that it was taking it over for about three billion dollars or so, uh, which was a big discount to even uh, Credit Suisse's closing price on the prior Friday, about a sixty percent discount. Now, UBS is apparently taking on uh, a lot of the risk inherent within Credit Suisse. Uh, but at the same time, um, between the Swiss National Bank and the Swiss government, uh, this is considered to be up to a $280 billion bailout. So, and that's equivalent to a third of the Swiss economy, the Swiss uh, national GDP. So this is really is massive for um, for the country and for the banking system. Both of these are considered um, globally, systemically important banks. And uh, UB, uh, uh, Credit Suisse had or has for now uh, about 50,000 employees. So that's also going to have a huge impact on the Swiss economy as uh, UBS decides to uh, you know, take advantage of synergies, which obviously they're going to be plenty. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, this just thing, this thing is just sort of snowballing. Um, and if I may, uh, a few days later, I was in Frankfurt and that was around the same time that uh, there was um, news that uh, uh, Deutsche Bank was having issues. Now, it, it's kind of funny how that happened because they had made an announcement that they were going to pay back a subordinate bond, a junior bond early. So that should have been interpreted as good news and it was not. The market took that as uh, looking risky. And so their shares uh, dropped about 20% over the uh, over the last week. Uh, this is this is not over and, and people really need to look at alternative assets and uh, the, the potential uh, that they offer for protection. It seems like people have been looking towards alternatives. Why do you think in particular, what do you think is the connection between the bank the issues in the banking system and people moving into precious metals right now? The, the lack of confidence and the lack of, of, uh, of security. I mean, really, uh, in the U.S., these, um, these bank failures, uh, if you can call them that, uh, there are some you know, different opinions around that in terms of how that has all played out. But initially, uh, we were told that there would not be bailouts. And then within a matter of a day or two, that flipped to 
complete bailouts. So depositors were guaranteed full uh, full protection of their deposits well beyond the 250,000 uh, US dollar uh, minimum or, or maximum, I should say. And so uh, naturally, I think investors are looking at this and despite that, uh, you know, that kind of um, ultimate uh, bailout, um, there is a lack of confidence. This is three banks in the U.S. within a span of a week, and then uh, one bank in Switzerland, a, ma- a major bank, one of its two largest banks, uh, within a matter of a few uh, the following week, and then issues with another globally systemic bank um, later that same week. And so these are these are all major banks for the global financial system and investors are smart enough to realize that and realize the implications. And so they're just looking at that and saying, well, what are my alternatives? Because at some point, um, even if and I I have my doubts, but even if all of these banks were to fail and governments would step in, nationalize them and promise, you know, full um, full bailouts to everyone, which at some point I think will become impossible. But but nonetheless, if they did, or if they kept doing it at least for a while, uh, investors are smart enough to realize that that means uh, huge inflation because the only way to do that is through money printing. And so they're looking for alternatives. And, and you know, the few alternatives that, that exist that are really not someone else's obligation become the go-to assets. And that's what we've seen over the last month or so. It, it, there's really been a flocking to, to precious metals. There has been. And I want to get your perspective also on some other issues we're seeing globally here. One of the main issues, reasons to invest in precious metals is it's outside of the system, right? And it's an alternative to the paper currency system. One of the things that has really been propping up the dollar for so long is that the dollar is the world reserve currency, and it's the most popular currency in the world. But we're seeing continued movements by different countries around the world uh, to de-dollarize, to use alternatives to the U.S. dollar, which ultimately should uh, result in less demand for the U.S. dollar and more inflation here in the U.S. So your perspective on de-dollarization that we're seeing right now. I do think that it's going to take a while. Uh, eventually, the dollar will be supplanted. I, I have little doubt about that. For that to ultimately happen in a um, in a sustained and in, a, in an impactful way is going to take several years, I, I would say at least. But we're seeing the really very serious beginnings of it. Um, just recently, I um, had read that uh, Russia and Iran were working on some kind of a gold-backed uh, digital currency that they could use for trade. Um, there was has been talk between Saudi Arabia and China to trade for oil in the yuan. Uh, there was a recent headline that there's a deal between China and Brazil to uh, do trade in the yuan. So, and then there is ongoing talk about um, some kind of a, perhaps a basket of, um, of currencies between the BRICS nations, which by the way, uh, continuously are growing. <laughs> There's, that's becoming a bigger and bigger club uh, by the day. And so you're seeing the, the world polarize, de- deglobalize, and that's going to mean um, basically everything becoming more expensive as countries try and companies try to onshore production and services, and the world just becomes more polarized. So, as you see, as you have that happen, you're definitely going to see an acceleration, an accelerated move away from the dollar. We're 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 seeing the very very clear beginnings of it right now. Already, the dollar peaked um, back in. If we look at how this played out, so in the fall of last year, around September or October, I think it was the dollar, uh, U.S. dollar index, I think, peaked around 112. And then early this year, it had bottomed around 100 or 102. It bounced pretty quickly to about 106. And right now, I think we're back down to about 102. And I think that, you know, this recent... um, rally, a dead cat bounce, I guess you could call it from about 100 to 106, um, was a relief rally after it had dropped so quickly from 112 to, to about 100. And I think that um, we've seen we've seen that peak in the dollar. You know, it peaked in, I think it was in the 80s around um, 
120, uh, no, sorry, well, well beyond that. And then um, in around uh, early 2000s, around uh, 120, then last year at 112. And so we're seeing successively lower peaks in the dollar. Um, and I think that we're going to see the, the dollar uh, index continue to move down towards my target for this year is around 95 and perhaps next year around 90 and then it'll continue it'll continue lower from there um, there's just too much debt in the system and um, trying to sustain high interest rates um, is not going to work there's too much debt um, and too much interest to pay on the debt to be able to do that uh, in a sustainable way at high interest rates it just becomes too expensive it becomes too big of a part of the of the national budget and so uh, lower rates are going to mean a weaker dollar. And that's what we're seeing play out. It seems like we have seen some sort of a pivot from the Fed ever since this Silicon Valley Bank uh, collapse. Because, I mean, if you look at the Fed balance sheet, it was, you know, they're do doing some quantitative tightening and then it just shot right back up, erasing months and months of uh, work that they had done there to reduce the balance sheet. So um, your perspective on, I guess, in this environment, how is the Fed going to react? It sounds like, you know, they can't keep interest rates uh, too high for too long, in your opinion. Agreed. Exactly. And so I, I would I would agree with that. I think that we've seen the beginnings of the pivot. Uh, like you say, that balance sheet uh, has really popped after months of dropping. Um, and I think it was something like already we're probably up about six hundred billion dollars since the, since that recent bottom um, of that uh, of the shrinking of the balance sheet. Um, I think that we're going to just see more of that play out. I think that um, you know what they can control is near-term rates. Uh, what they what they're going to possibly try to control, at least for a while, is long-term rates. We're probably going to start to see uh, yield curve control, and so they're going to start to uh, print more money to buy longer-term bonds in order to try to uh, minimize the differential between longer and shorter-term rates. But I think we can expect that to, to come, and that's to try to basically, in, in, in a sense, bail out the economy. If you've got long-term rates that are really just too high for people, um, whether that's corporations that are boring, whether that's mortgages, um, then the economy really is going to suffer. They, they do want to, the economy to slow down, but uh, much, much higher rates on the long end are just too detrimental and I think they are going to step in and uh, so that's going to be uh, a growing balance sheet there, there really is no other uh, solution for them now then the impact on the metals that we're going to be seeing your perspective uh, your take on that because we've seen over the last couple of weeks a significant rise in both gold and silver um, your outlook then for the metals in this environment do we just continue to go higher from here do, are you anticipating a pullback short term your take? Yeah, I mean, I think that we've seen a pretty reasonable rally. I don't think it's been outsized in any way. Uh, silver was around uh, 18, 19, 20, 18 in the fall, and then more recently around 20 ish. We're now around 23. That's pretty reasonable as far as I'm concerned. It's still very undervalued. So I don't, you know, you can always have in the very near term, that's obviously the hardest, hardest. Uh, time frame to, to predict but I think silver is probably going to sustain this kind of level for a while and I do think that later in the year we'll probably see it somewhere north of 25 probably 27 28 is I think pretty realistic uh, towards the end of the year gold right now is pretty strong um, about a month ago it was just over 1800 around 1810 or so we're now at north of 1960 1970 really pushing up on that psychological two thousand dollar barrier i think once we get through that and we can sustain that for several days or, or weeks that's going to start to become a floor and i think that later this year we can easily uh, realistically expect to see 
you know, 21, 2200, perhaps even start to push uh, higher from there towards the end of the year. So both metals, I think, have a really nice uh, uh, outlook for the rest of uh, 2023 and, and certainly will be on that because the turmoil it is not over. The bank, I don't think that the banking crisis is over. Uh, I think we're going to see, we're going to continue to see some some surprises on that side. And that's going to be very supportive for, for precious metals. Now, besides the stresses in the system for silver as well, it's an industrial metal and you've wrote a, written a whole book on all the bullish fundamentals for silver. Your target, I believe, is 300 for silver. Can you explain more about that besides the stresses in the system that we're seeing right now? What are some of the other bullish fundamentals? So, yeah, I mean, just to be clear, you know, I think that $300 silver would be sort of an ultimate mania peak. Uh, I, to get to that number, I looked at what happened in 1980 when silver reached $50, when gold was 850 And if you, at the time, the gold-silver ratio had bottomed right around 15. So my peak, uh, my conservative peak in gold would be, would be about 5,000. And if you use that same ratio of 15, that's uh, silver north of $300, about $333. So you know, I, I went with 300 and then I use other measures. These are all detailed in the book in terms of how I get to $300 silver. And again, I say that really that's in the case of, of a, a mania blow off kind of peak. It's not something that silver would reach and, and necessarily sustain on a on an ongoing basis. Um, and, and to be clear, uh, the way I see uh, silver rising over the next several years and decade is that it's going to see a rising floor under the silver price where it's going to keep uh, you know, uh, testing a, a new higher floor as time goes on. That I think will be supported by the industrial demand side of silver. It's what's really, really bullish uh, for silver in particular is the, uh, is the solar uh, demand. Uh, solar alone represents 12% of the silver demand of the entire silver market every year, and that's growing very rapidly. Um, it was about 140 million ounces out of uh, 1.24 billion ounces last year, and that's expected to grow. The International Energy Agency sees uh, solar installations going uh, up about eight and a half times from current levels just over the next eight years. So if you look at you know, silver requiring 12% of current demand and that installations of silver uh, panels being up eight and a half, say nine times almost over the next eight years. Silver could require all of the silver, uh, silver demand for solar could require all of the current silver output in the next uh, eight years. It's just, it's incredible. So that's really going to help support and push silver prices higher. And I think that it's going to be when we, come into crises like we just have with banking, it's going to be um, the investment demand that, that'll be the wild card that'll help push silver higher um, in spikes in, in that kind of uh, scenario. Um, and then you've got things like uh, EVs that are really taking on uh, a life of their own in terms of uh, the, the share of the, of the automotive market. EVs require twice as much silver as um, as the internal combustion engine vehicles, and we've got silver all around us. It's in electronics, um, in electrical uh, applications, both in automotive and everything else. If you, you know, you've got an iPad, uh, some kind of a tablet around you, a cell phone, a, uh, a flat screen TV. It's really in all these, um, all these um, switches and contacts because it's the most conductive and it's the most uh, reflective of all of the metals. In fact, it sets the standard at 100. Every other metal is based on silver in terms of comparison for those two characteristics. And then you've got medical applications. You know, silver is a biocide and, it, um, and um, bacteria, viruses do not, um, do not get used to and adjust to the effects of silver. So it's great at killing um, viruses and, and bacteria. And so uh, we see ongoing developments on the medical side where silver is being used more and more to, uh, to help uh, prevent uh, uh, diseases and, uh, and so on. So really, uh, silver is, I like to call it the, uh, the uh, Swiss Army knife of metals because it has just so many applications. It's really the only one metal, if you think about it, that is really both industrial and investment 
it's long been it's been it's the it's the oldest uh, metal to be used um, as uh, as money before even gold and on a much larger scale globally over the last sort of four or five thousand years than gold today gold is about eight or to ten percent used industrially because it's that much more expensive so really silver has a very very bright future now as for silver supply i know last year we saw a huge silver deficit um this year there's an expected to be a silver deficit as well your take on that because it seems like is there even enough silver out there for all the demand that will be coming? So there always is at the right price. And that's what I think people need to understand. If, you know, there's this whole argument about uh, gold being used as um, or, or, or gold being used to back a, uh, a fiat or, or not a fiat, but a, used uh, as a gold standard, part of a gold standard for a money, a monetary system. And people think, well, there's not enough gold out there. But really, that's false. It all comes down to price. If you have the right price, then there's always going to be enough of that metal. And I think the same thing is true for silver, uh, whether it's on the industrial side or whether it's on the monetary side. Um, there's going to be enough silver if you have it at the right price. At the right price, uh, it uh, it obliges, even on the industrial side, um, users to look for alternatives or to start being more thrifty with with their use of silver uh, but um, it's relatively inexpensive right now and so even considerable amounts of silver in industrial applications does not um, does not deter the use of it sufficiently and i was just reading um, on some research uh, by the university of new south wales in australia and they were saying that uh, you know we are not thrifting silver quickly enough to be able to compensate for the growth in demand. And this really, uh, as they were, their focus was on uh, solar panels once again, because the amount of the, the level of growth in solar app, uh, installations is really through the roof. And they, they believe that by 2050, we could be at uh, nearly all of uh, the current silver supply going exclusively to solar. So really the research is pointing to a lot more um, silver use and a lot of that being driven again by solar. It's really, it's actually the cheapest form of of incremental electricity in many countries because the price of, of panels has, has come down so much. And it's interesting too that uh, China dominates the solar uh, panel manufacturing uh, industry. About 80% of solar panels are manufactured in China. Um, and so, you know, you really have to ask yourself, they, um, China is going to become a, a serious player in silver because they need a lot of silver to manufacture all of these uh, solar panels. Uh, you know, it's, it's not unrealistic that some manufacturers either are going to uh, panic if one day they don't get their silver delivered, that they need to manufacture their smartphones or their solar panels or their electrical um, uh, uh, switches for auto automobiles, whatever it might be. Uh, either they'll panic because they can't get that delivered or they'll, uh, you know, um, look to move before that and, and either... Uh, take uh, part of an important silver project, uh, take a buy into a, a, lar a silver company in order to secure offtake, whatever it might be. I think that we can look to these kinds of events happening in the silver markets, uh, and that will certainly drive uh, drive it higher, both the, the metal and the uh, the miners. It seems like we have a lot of things coming together at once where you have, you know, the crisis in the banking system, you have the crisis in the currencies, you know, for the U.S. dollar, uh, de-dollarization around the world. And we also have industrial demand for silver. And at least right now at current prices, it seems like not necessarily enough supply. Um, any last thoughts before we let you go? And can you share with the viewers uh uh, where they can find you online. Sure. So I'm going to go back one more time to the uh, to the industrial demand side and the solar panels and what I think um, viewers might want to take away from this. And this all of what I said about demand in, in uh, growth from solar does not even take into account uh, demand. Um, sorry, the, dem the growth, the potential growth or faster growth in demand that will come from new technologies. 
because um, the next technology in solar is expected to use 50% more silver per panel. And you've got things like um, double-sided sol uh, solar panels. Um, you've got things like multi-layered solar panels. The, so the next technology could use as much as 50% more silver and the likely technology to follow on that could use as much as 150% more silver than currently. I haven't even factored any of that in, in, in the numbers that I gave you prior. So really, so the solar industry is one to watch in terms of demand for silver. So besides that, you know, silver has always been a go-to in terms of uh, safety uh, as a safe haven uh, when you have things like banking crises, inflation crises, that's not going to change. Um, I think it's important for viewers to realize too that uh, there's a, what we call a FOMO aspect to silver. Um, you have one in gold, but I think it's even amplified for silver because people who are going to be late to this market probably will first see what happens in gold. They'll see gold go through 2000, ultimately through 3000 and even higher. They're gonna, they're gonna notice that late. They're gonna find that too expensive. They're gonna look at what alternatives there might be. Um, at that point, silver might be $50, it might be $75. And they're gonna say, well, you know, at $75, silver is still a lot cheaper on a per ounce basis. I want some silver. And so they will flock to silver. It will be difficult to get to. Premiums will, you know, have gone through the roof and that's just going to feed in itself. Gold and silver are markets where uh, people want more of it when the price goes higher, <laughs> which is, you know, kind of uh, backwards intuitively, but that is just very simply how it uh, how it plays out. So this these markets will feed on themselves. I think they will make uh, what we've seen in cryptocurrencies happen in the last couple of years uh, look like child's play and um, th they will be the assets of last resort. They're going to draw in a lot of money and become much, much bigger, uh, you know, per capita uh, basis. And, you know, there are a couple, if, if I may, just a couple of last things. Um, it's interesting that um, uh, Russia and Iran were talking, have been talking about a gold backed uh, digital currency to do to uh, to complete trade deals. So we're talking about gold. You know, this is not just some sort of fiat thing. And then uh, earlier last year, when um, Ukraine uh, was was invaded by Russia, you had uh, the two largest gold backed cryptocurrencies. I believe these are Tether Gold and Paxos Gold. They had their uh, combined market caps reach over a billion dollars. So that signaled to me that people who were comfortable with crypto had seen uh, crypto come off considerably, um, were looking for alternatives. And they started seeing gold certainly go, th go to, through 2000 at that point and um, decided that they were comfortable with a form of crypto that was backed by gold. And so that drove those combined market caps to a billion dollars. And I think that uh, there is probably some room for that whole space to continue to grow as well. So the crypto space to continue to grow, especially for those that are backed by precious metals, both gold and silver. I think that uh, that's something that uh, people need to keep an eye on and, and uh, that will certainly uh, gain some ground in the next few years. Where they can follow me. <laughs> Sorry, that one last thing. So uh, I published my book last year, The Great Silver Bull. That's available on Amazon in Kindle, in uh, paperback, and since uh, late last year in an audiobook version. Um, and besides that, they can follow my work at Silver Stock Investor. It's the only silver focused investment newsletter um, that I know of. Uh, and I'm, I'm, you can follow me on Twitter and on LinkedIn. Uh, happy to see anybody uh, follow me there. Be happy to respond to any inquiries as well. So that should, uh, that should cover it. Once again, Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Elijah, as always, it's been my pleasure. Thanks so much. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered.
Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we can let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, Call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.